Hi there, Glocal Citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around doing something in the world. I'm your host, Florence Adu, and I'm back with another awesome individual. She's one of the lights in the media space here in Ghana globally. She's just a treat to have on the program. She's executive director of the ARMA Institute of Emotional Justice, which is a global institute providing emotional education in the context of race, gender, and culture. But that's not all. She's also an acclaimed multimedia journalist, documentary maker, and playwright, with productions appearing on stages in New York, Chicago, and Atlanta. She's a radio host and fellow podcaster as creator of The Spin, which is a BBC and NPR production in collaboration with Pastor Tiffany. And she's a television or has been a television political commentator on MSNBC, CNN, Brit TV, BET, MSNBC. And her work has been published in Gawker, Alternet.org, Salon.com, and The Huffington Post. Esther Amar. Welcome to Global Citizens. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here and join your growing global community. So let's get started. Tell us more about where you're from, where you are local, and more about your craft. So I lovingly refer to myself as a global black chick. Home is three cities in three countries on three continents. So I'm talking to you from Accra in Ghana. That is current home, home of my family, home of my lineage, home of my ancestry. My mother's Ashanti. My daddy's in Zuma. Go tribe. Mm -hmm. Home is also, so that's the city on the continent of Africa. Home is also London, where I was born, partially schooled, did my journalism education and worked as a journalist. And New York is my third home in North America, where I worked as a journalist and lived for almost eight years in Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, Do or Die. And so those are the places that are local to me, that I claim community, that I have lived, loved, work, and continue to claim as home and to live, love, and work. Okay, nice. So how did you come to your craft? So to me, my craft is essentially as a storyteller. The medium by which I tell stories, the reason I tell them, the vision behind them manifests in these different ways, but fundamentally, I'm a storyteller. But then I have a definition of that as I lead a global institute. And the definition for me with storyteller is to articulate the contemporary lived experience in the context of history that centers race and gender as a strategy for the purpose of structural change so that the work that I do with emotional justice, which is a visionary framework for racial healing, I use stories manifest as projects to do that specific thing. With journalism, it's the same thing. With plays, it's the same thing. So the medium may change, but the foundational element is storytelling as a strategy to make structural change that's about the dismantling of systemic inequity, the confronting of racism, and the well-being of global Black people. So for me, it's really simple, but the manifestation is both creative, right? Because for me, projects are creative curricula and they enable us to not just engage, but to connect with the intent of making change as a result of challenging, you know, narrative or our perspective, our lens on a particular, on a particular people and the way that we see the world. So that's my work. So tell us more about what inspired you to move in that direction. What are some of the key, key points that put you where you are now? Three pivotal moments in 1997 were really the impetus that led to me doing all this work, specifically the work of emotional justice, which I consider my life's work. It is purpose, it is passion, it is power. And three assignments in 1997 to Philadelphia, Ghana, and South Africa. Philadelphia was for the Million Woman March, at Eakins mm -hmm. Oval, former site of slave auctions. Ghana was covering 40 years of independence and South Africa was doing an interview with Desmond Tutu and meeting Steve Biko's widow and eldest son around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So they were three pivotal moments that did two things. They transformed the way that I even thought about journalism 
and they led me to explore the role of the emotional when it comes to justice, activism, race, and systemic inequity. And so in Ghana, covering 40 years of independence as a journalist, I learned that the 1966 coup, which had always been a story about the ending of Kwame Nkrumah's presidency and the beginning of this balance and mix of the ballot and the bullet when it came to political leadership. A story told to me by my dad, who was a former ambassador and a politician. I learned when I was covering 40 years of independence that it was actually my mother who was in the house who physically faced soldiers, who dealt with tanks rolling up to home and beating down the door and confronting her and her daughters. And that changed the lens for how I thought about the way our history is told. The broken silence of my mother made me think of the untold stories because of unbroken silences by African women. And how does that change the story of how we understand our nation, how we understand our history? So it changed the way that I thought about journalism and it changed the way that I thought about history. That was Ghana. Philadelphia was covering the Million Woman March. And I mean, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of women coming from all over the world, gathering on Eton. I was one. You were one of them? Oh, wow. Synergy. Yeah. Synergy. Yes. Thousands of women gathering. I went to cover it. I'd never been to Philadelphia before. Literally reached out, said to them, I'm a journalist. I'm in London. I'm a black Brit by way of Ghana. I would like to come and cover this story, but I've never been to Philadelphia before. I don't know anybody there. They did beautiful outreach, organized accommodation, welcomed me. I rolled with a crew that organized the march, got to meet the phenomenal keynote that was Winnie Mandela, and got to meet Jada Pinkett Smith, who was really helping with the organizing and the emceeing on the day. And I got to tell Winnie Mandela that I was headed to South Africa to do interviews and coverage on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And at the time, I had a whole bunch of interviews lined up with the leadership of the African National Congress, the ANC, Desmond Tutu, Oliver Tambo, Oliver Tambo's widow, all these different men of the ANC. And Winnie Mandela Mm, said to me, I told her about my dad being Ghanaian and being part of the independence movement that got Kwame Nkrumah to presidency, and that he was one of the advocates who fought for the armed wing of the ANC, Mkonte Wisizwe, to get training in Ghana. So I was telling her these stories and saying, this is the connection that I have to you, to South Africa. And in this moment of gathering around these global black women, fighting for a humanity denied them by the systemic racism of America. And she said to me, my daughter, what you must do is go into the townships of South Africa and listen to the women and ask them what forgiveness looks looks like for them. And that guidance, which I followed, taught me that the way that emotion had been defined was really within the confines of a systemic inequity and a whiteness. But in speaking to black women who were navigating what it meant to be survivors of apartheid, but who had lost children, who had lost loved ones, who had lost husbands, spoke about rage, spoke about the power of rage to move them, spoke about their anger in having a forgiveness brokered without their consent, spoke about a refusal to engage this kind of emotion that did not recognize it, that what they sought was justice. And it began for me, the equating of emotionality, blackness and gender as a justice project for us as a black people to think about the emotional and its role in being shaped by systems of inequity and brutality. So that there were these fault lines around race and politics and healing and emotion within structures of inequity that meant that our emotions were actually a justice project. So those trips began the work that would culminate to building the framework of emotional justice, which I define as a visionary framework for racial healing, that would be about dismantling what I call emotional patriarchy, one of the pillars of emotional Mm -hmm. justice, where a system essentially caters to, prioritizes, and centralizes the feelings of white men. They become the impetus Mm -hmm. for, for policy, for power, for leadership, and that shapeshifts 
how we relate to each other as a people, as a global black people, as a global white people and each other. And the dismantling of an emotional patriarchy would lead to an emotional justice that would be a healing that was very, very necessary. So really that's the journey that led to the framework that is now implemented by the Institute that I lead, which is a global team here in Ghana, across the US and in the UK. Nice, nice. So you, I mean, now there's all this conversation about inclusion, you know, so we have chief inclusion officers and people like that, and you were way ahead of that, right? So you were light years ahead of that. And so now that you're seeing that this is now common vernacular, how are you seeing your work being demanded and potentially being, I don't even want to say co-opted, but how are you seeing your work entering into this now global economic landscape? It's absolutely entering it in a, a major way, specifically because our work is to interrupt the way DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, has become a multi-million, very profitable industry that hasn't led to the kind of diversity or inclusion that it was actually created to do. And the reason that it hasn't right. done that is the nature of it is really designed around the comfort and the discomfort of white people. But actually, yeah, and because it's designed around that, of course it will fail because who intentionally will move to the level of discomfort that will make the kind of change that creates equity, which really then requires you to reimagine your relationship to power and to lose some of that, to share it means in terms of whiteness to lose something. And so the nature of its construction is problematic and cannot create equity. The power and the blessing for us is entering the space, challenging that. And in this moment where there is a huge opening up and a demand for DEI services in the wake of, of course, corona and the disproportionate impact, black people, the horrific devastation of witnessing a murder and an execution in the killing of the murder of George Floyd, and the protests that followed. That opening up globally led to a much greater demand for our work and for people to be open to it in a way they were not. So for example, we look at the notion of loss as a result of the pandemic, as a result of the state's approach to bodies, as a result of the economy, but through the lens of the global black experience, the lived experience within the context of history. So one of the things that we started to include in our DEI training is what we call the emotional justice equity package. So there are seven stages to grief as defined within the world of psychology. But in our structure, we argue that grief is about loss. And what's been lost as in addition to the horror of the numbers around life has been these major economies that have been dominated by black people but also the way that black people's bodies are criminalized, the absence of empathy, the loss of humanity, and the way that people recover from disaster is through assistance. You need some kind of recovery package. And history shows us that when there's been horrific losses as a result of war, the result of those losses has been legislation to help people recover. And so what we do is we challenge this notion of an emotional resilience, saying that nobody bounces back from trauma, which is what resilience requires you to do. It puts the onus on the individual to recover alone at their own expense, as opposed to recognizing that these are institutional issues, institutional failures, institutional inequity, and they must be massively engaged and responsible for contributing to resources. So part of our DEI training is to one, transform organizational cultures, Recognize that diversity is about outcome, not intention. And what policy is, a diversity policy is an intention. A statement to, of commitment to Black Lives Matter is an intention. But no business measures its success or its profitability based on what it intends to sell. It only measures it according to the sales. So we're looking at diversity, equity, inclusion, and changing the paradigm, saying that the only way we measure your success is what is the outcome? What is the pipeline to power? And how has that changed? How have you interrupted a power frame that has been predominantly white and male and ensured you've created a pipeline that enables access by those who are marginalized and then creates the resources to enable them not to just to be successful, but to maintain that success and expand it beyond the kind of individual exceptionalism, that isolationist approach 
that has often happened. So yes, there is a demand, like our most recent client was an Ivy League college. We're still working with them, working with organizations, working now with in South Africa. So we've seen the demand explode. And that's important because ultimately emotional justice is a framework that's saying this kind of change could never have been easy because the systems that were built to create inequity were built to last. They were not built to be dismantled easily. So the idea that you would just do a little tweaking and that would lead to transformation, I call BS. There's no way that was ever going to happen. So you always needed a substantive, robust framework to make that kind of change. And, and that's what we're doing. That's what we built. So how long is your typical engagement in terms of what you know to be the way that you can actually see this progress and go beyond intention? Because I feel like this could be like years of an engagement with an organization to really dig deep and uncover and unshift. So what kind of time do you typically engage with your clients? So we do, we have bespoke flagship DEI training and it's in the form of two forms. The major one we do is in the form of a virtual three-day workshop that is followed up by either three months, six months, nine months, 12 months of pure facilitation. But the difference in the way that we work is that we're really targeted and focused about what specifically we're going to change and to use that example for the organization to then replicate in other parts of wherever they are. So very quick example, our last client, our most recent client, Ivy League University, we were working with a particular department. And so it starts off always by privileging the lived experience, the stories of whoever is the most marginalized. So in this case, we did this mm -hmm. entire session with students, both alumni and current students, where they shared through all these different exercises their experience of the culture of the organization. We then treat narrative as data. So that's day one. Day two is when all the faculty and the staff and the heads of department who predominantly white then join us. So day one is always whoever is the most marginalized. They are the privileged space. They are the ones to whom time is purely devoted, uninterrupted, and without the presence of all their faculty and management, any of those things, understanding that the power dynamic, when they're present, will change what is said. We want to make sure we get the full unadulterated truth. We treat that narrative as data. But what we do is because our strategy is storytelling, we collapse that data and present it as a 25-minute monologue using an artist, using an actress. And the idea is to get the organization not to consume data, which is what happens when you present traditional data to an organization, but to connect to the lived experience of the people mm -hmm. they are supposed to serve, which is the students. And you see mm -hmm. powerfully how that connection is a transformative moment. Because we'll ask them, how do you define the cultural environment of your organization? And they'll say, we'll think it's inclusive. We think it's this. We think it's that. That's their perspective. And then we'll present them with how their learners felt about this same environment that they just defined as diverse exclusives. That connection moves them out of privileging their own lens and centering the lens of the marginalized. And that's the intention. The first transformation is to dismantle the centering that white leadership does and center whoever is the most marginalized in your organization. And that specific exercise does that. So we present date now we present we turn narrative into data and we present our data in a creative way, designed specifically to connect rather than consume numbers. That moment, which is transformative, opens the entire department and the space and the people up to do what we call go in and do the more invasive work of saying, okay, now you see the gap between your intention and the outcome as defined by their experience. Our work now close the gap. And in this case, with an academic institution, we took a specific course and looked at all the ways that it was exclusionary, not diverse, not inclusive, didn't do the things that they said it wanted to do and said, this is the course we're going to target and we're going to fully transform. And you are going to do that work. We do it in three ways. We call it the three P's, pipeline, partnership and production. We are in partnership with you to do that work. You are going to build a pipeline that changes that experience. And the production, what you're going to produce, is a completely transformed model that did not exist before we came. 
And so what we say is the work is yours to do, but you need a framework, a process, a path, and a practice to do it. Once we've done that first work, so we're now in the second stage of the work with them. We've done the three-day workshop. They assign somebody to be the facilitator to work with us. Amazing chief, chief training facilitator, Francesca Adedigi, a phenomenal, phenomenal leader of the Institute's education training, diversity training department. They work with her one-on-one, which they'll now do for the next six months. And in that process, they have to transform this entire particular course Having made that transformation, they apply the same set of rules to replicate in other parts of their department. That's how we work. That's brilliant. Thanks. I'm just like, <laughs> that's brilliant. I love how you succinctly decided and understand what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. So I look forward to the white papers and the case studies that kind of show this is how you actually do achieve emotional justice. Absolutely. Um, so I want to take a pivot and you told us where you've lived, where you call home. But I want to get a little bit more in depth about your why the where, because you, you moved back from the U.S. to Ghana in the last decade. And so the question is, how did you come to be living, working, and playing where you currently live? My last year in New York was really tough for me. It was really tough. I was exhausted. I was burnt out. I was broken down. To the outside world, I was this high-profile commentator and I was on air and I was on MSNBC and I was CNN and I was doing these campaigns. But personally, I was falling apart, honestly. And I had always known, I had always said that I would move back to Accra and to Ghana. I'd always known and I'd always said that I wanted to move home and build, bring all my skills home and build community and change the way that I lived. So I always knew that I was going to do that. I did not necessarily plan to do it in the circumstances that I did. And so my last year was very tough. It was very emotional. I was very broken. I was exhausted. I was depressed. And I took a trip back for and spent three months here and just saw how much the city had changed. And I'd said, I'd been going home for years, to going home to visit for years. I would go every year, 10 weeks, 11 weeks, 12 weeks. I would do work. I would go on assignments. I'd always been going home. But as anybody who going home and living at home are two different worlds, as anybody who does that work knows. And so there's always a kind of a seduction and temporariness, and then you have to negotiate what it will be to live. But my last year was the decision maker, and I said, I'm not going to I can't go another year in this space. My emotional health is suffering. My spiritual health is suffering. And I felt like I had got to a place where it was too much about profile. It was Mm. too much about this perception of who I was, even though I was in trouble and I was really suffering. And I was just in Mm. trouble. And so I said, I'm not going to heal here. And I cannot recover here. And... I think that for me, there was an element of New York where I had become slightly, not slightly, I had become addicted to the profile that I had achieved and I wasn't doing enough internal work to be healthy. And so in order to become healthy again, it was definitely time for me to go. And the blessing that I had was that I had another home to come to. I had a place that I had a, a city within a nation that I called home. And my father years earlier had said, I want to buy land. And we, I always would really, it would move me to tears when I would go visit his grave when I came home. Because I remember years ago when he was still building the place that I'm living in now. And I would tease him. I was still traveling back and forth, traveling around Europe, traveling around Africa. And I would tease him and I'd be like, Pa, really? You're building a house for your kids. Ain't nobody really coming home to do all of that. We've got worlds to travel, <laughs> da, 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 da. global black chick moving, yeah. moving, all of that. And my father, yeah. my father said to me, you know, I didn't always feel that I had a home. And I want you always to feel that when you land on this soil, you're coming home. And that one of the ways you're coming home is because of what your father built for you. He said, as my daughter, as one of my four daughters, five of us all together, that when you set feet on the soil, when you plant your feet on the soil, when you breathe in the air of Ghana, when you taste the sun, the smell of the mangoes, the morning air, 
that there's a place that you call home and that you know that your father built that for you because that's the way that I'm going to show you that I love you. Maybe you don't need that now. He said, but what if there's a time when you need that and it wasn't there? What would you do? So that last year, I had that in my mind a lot. And I said, it's time. It's time to come home. And so it's really important to me that there is not this blaze of glory that I came home and it wasn't for me. I was broken. I was broken down. I was depressed. I was really sad. I was burnt out. I was exhausted and I needed healing. And that's the reason that I came home. And then once I came home and I started to do that, my own internal work around healing, really get my own emotional justice, then I could start to put my head back up and start to do the, the next stage of the work that I had always knew that I wanted to do and that I had planned to do. That's really how I came home. Right. right. That's lovely. I love that your father had put that into your mind and, and understood because this, I have the same kind of experience. My mother was like, when she was building, I'm like, why are you doing all that? Why? And so I'm here now and I'm like, wow, thanks mom. I really... God bless yeah, you. God bless I you, think, Pa. Say, I, say yeah. my, I, call my, I call my dad Pa. I always say, God bless you, Pa, every day. Every morning when I get up and do my meditation, I do this exercise. And when I come back through the gates of the house, I do a kiss up to the sky and I say, God bless you, Pa, every morning. I love it. That's wonderful. Yeah. So being back, you've been back for a bit. And so I always like to give my listeners a little bit of a taste of the flair of the location where we are, where you are. Right. So we want to hear what you hear. So I asked my guests to share a word, phrase, or saying that is a meaningful part of your local experience and why or how you came to value it as global speak. It's a visual conversation for me. And it's the way that it is dark and then sunrise in a split second in Ghana. Mm. And I don't see it, I feel it. I feel it and it opens my eyes up in the morning and gets me up and out of bed. I love that because that is so true. Yeah. That is so It is true. That encompasses the entire experience for me of being home. I literally feel it. And I open my eyes. If I kind of woke up in the middle of the night and it's pitch black and it's dark, that's one thing. But my eyes are closed and I can feel the change. I'm going to open my eyes again and it's sunrise. And it's time for me to get up and go work. And it's a visual conversation. I feel like it's ancestral it's spiritual i don't i can't fully explain it but i call it a visual conversation because my eyes are closed i feel like the universe is talking to my spirit but i can't see until i open my eyes and it's sunrise yeah i mean it's so because nowhere do i i mean so i feel like i get up with the sun no matter what but here it's just automatic all of a sudden i'm awake and right. it is literally as you say like it's dark but then it's immediately like the light is there. So, right, right. wow, that's you, you're such a poet. I mean, I can tell the creative self in you. So. <laughs> so it's lovely to hear. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about some of your works beyond the emotional justice work, some of your works and your creative works. You've done a few plays and your podcast. So tell us more about kind of the genesis of some of your creative. And I know that's all a statement about the same underlying framework that you mentioned, but tell us more about some of those works. To me, it's all the same thing, just manifest through different mediums. When I trained as a journalist, I've always been a creative storyteller. But when I trained as a journalist, I always felt like they were trying to exorcise the creativity out of me because I trained in what then was magazine journalism and then news journalism. And there's a very particular way that news journalism happened. And it literally is. You take all the emotion out. It's fact. There's a brevity to it. There's a specificity to it. And so I'd learned to write that way. And there was a point at which, for me, it just was not the most effective way to tell stories because, I mean, I mean, literally, I created a, a framework called emotional justice. And I'm in a medium that requires me to exercise emotion. So it wasn't going to work. And because storytelling is at my foundation and all the work of emotional justice is through storytelling, it's just different mediums that I do it. And mm. the power of theater as it's a way to have some of the hardest conversations in the most loving ways because people don't feel targeted. They can connect to mm -hmm. theater, mm -hmm. they can connect to drama, they can connect to a character and it engages conversations that you might not otherwise have because they can talk about the character and have a moment. It's something that I definitely saw when I was in um, New York 
I worked with an absolutely wonderful, wonderful production, wonderful man, Voza Rivers, New Heritage Theatre. Shout out to Voza, shout out to Deborah Ann Bird, who was an extraordinary producer, artist, actress in her own right. And Voza was uh, my producer and New Heritage Theatre was the uh, organization that produced my work there. We did a play called Saviour, which was for me an, a, an exploration within emotional justice about masculinity. And there were conversations that I would ha was having because I would do this annual series called Hashtag EJ Convos, which was with black men because emotional justice has always included black people. It's a framework that has always included black people uh, and our healing. And so there were things that I wanted to get to and I was like, I just can't get to them in this particular medium. What's another way for me to access that? And really that's what plays out for me. Creatively, they just speak to a part of me that is just purely joyous, that is unformed and unstructured, and I literally play. And I say that because I've never gone to theatre school. I wasn't trained about how to write plays. As somebody who was trained as a journalist to do radio documentaries and to write scripts, of course, you have to create a soundtrack to a story. And it has cadence and rhythm and valleys. It has all of this musicality to it because that's what's going to make the documentary work. And so I understood that I had a, there was a transfer of skills, but I didn't know anything about the structure of writing a play. But it started because I'd written a very, very bad self-published first book. I was in New York. I did not want to do readings. I didn't really understand why people did readings. I mean, I think it's the part of me that is very British. It was very weird for me to stand in front of people and read out of a book. I'm like, why don't I just give it to you read it for yourselves? I didn't get it. And I didn't want to do it. I felt so awkward and uncomfortable. And so I said, you know yeah. what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn it into a monologue. Get an amazing, I mean, in New York, get an amazing black British actress and I'll create dialogue out of my chapter. And that was the foundation for what would become the first play that I wrote, which was a one woman show. And what it taught me was that I had an absolute natural, it was a very natural space for me. I got so much pleasure, you know, out of it. And number one literally became five. But the theater always has an underlying intention that's around justice, that's around healing, and that's around global black people. But it's different than the other mediums in that it's such an organic space. I never really write a play unless I feel to write a play. It really doesn't have the same, whereas with, with of course, running an institute, you develop a project, you work, you do research and development, there's a way that you create it. Even with using theater in the training that we do, it's the result of a series of exercises. But the theater that I create when I'm trying to tell a story about an element of emotional justice, is such a pure relationship with spirit and emotion for me. And I get so much pleasure out of developing character and writing stories and dialogue specifically, and just moving from another part of my, of my spirit. It's always been joy. It, different experiences, writing for New York was one experience, writing when I came home to Ghana, learning different Englishes. Like I was born and raised in London, so I speak black British English. When I went to New York and I was writing plays, I had to learn specifically Brooklyn English for a particular character that I was writing. When I came home to Ghana, learning that mix of pigeon and the way we drop tree into yeah. just phrases. So I love all of that. It's the, one of the things that I love is it, it makes me an internal student of creativity. It maintains an absolute humility. I've had wonderful artists here like Pearl Kokodake, who was just a beast on stage, brilliant. And what we've done here is look at how do you take traditional spaces and make them creative in order to change the business model of theatre. Mm -hmm. And that was important because the nature of theatre here, whereas in New York you have multiple spaces, you have lots and lots of spaces where you can actually put on a play. Black box, designed for smaller audiences, designed for you to workshop things. In Accra, and specifically I'm talking about Accra, you have the National Theatre, that's an 800 seater yes. space. There's no yes. way you're gonna, first of all, even as a production, and I'm still a businesswoman, so the idea yes. that I would even try that, you'd never, it's never gonna be profitable, it's never going to work. Yes. There were other spaces, I didn't really like their acoustics, I didn't like how they worked. And so we were thinking, what about these 
auditorium spaces where they just do events like the British Council here in Accra, mm -hmm. which is a space where everybody knows it's a very straightforward stage. And then there's an audience there. And I was at an event and somebody was stepping onto the stage and they tripped. And I was like, why did they trip? And I saw the stage move. And I was like, oh, they have a movable stage. So that's where I thought, mm -hmm. I wonder if we can reimagine this space as theater in the round. And so mm -hmm. what we did, I have an amazing technical team. I am a Dinkra, led by Ma Michael Bediako, brilliant, brilliant team of young men. And we literally went into the British Council, went into the very traditional auditorium and said to them, we're going to turn this into a theater. And of course, it's a cross. So they laughed at us and told us we were foolish. Yeah. <laughs> I was a foolish girl with foolish dreams. And I said, I'm, we're going to hire it. We're going to pay you. We did this, you know, we negotiated this deal and came in. I mean, it took days because yeah. it's a cross. So it took days. And we literally reimagined the entire space, moved the stage, created a central space and blacked out all the windows re-rigged the entire lighting system so that it, the, the, the stage was flooded with light. And if you were sitting in the audience, you could literally just reach out and touch the foot of the actor. And it was a beautiful experience. And for the British Council, they were like, oh, we had no idea. Never, yeah. People came in, they took photos. We had a lot of artists and filmmakers to come and see it. And they walked in and they were like, wow, this, I feel like I just walked into a theater. So the idea was going to be, and it is still, that we want to develop an emotional justice theater festival that looks oh, specifically yeah. around issues of gender healing and violence and mm -hmm. trains young women how to tell their own stories using theater as their mm -hmm. medium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's wow. the intention. And we wanted to demonstrate that one, you could take a traditional space and turn it into a theater with tools that you could take an issue, turn it into play. And, and my plays are always very specific. I'm production oriented. So one of the yeah. challenges here in Accra is that the productions are 10 people, 11 people, they're, they're big. And if they're big as a producer, that makes them expensive. It makes people less willing to pay for them. My yeah. productions are all about the dialogue. I never have, the biggest play we've done is three people on a mm -hmm. stage. This mm -hmm. one was, it was called Safe Cargo, two people on a stage. It was about a young couple going through a breakup but we were looking at gender violence and the legacy of trauma, specifically about the humanizing of um, young women dealing with that trauma and what it means to try and find pleasure again in your own body, but also to realize that your healing may not lie in these traditional ways of thinking about respectability, which is to get married. And we wanted to, to engage that and challenge that and, and work through that. And it was a young couple, it was two people on a stage we turned the, the auditorium stage into an apartment, went to, there's a, there's a shop here in Accra mall called Game, went to Game, bought out rugs, bought out all this stuff and literally recreated an apartment and had the play there and all the, the United Nations agencies, beautiful audience, standing room only, had to turn people away. And what it taught everybody was this is doable, these are effective tools, People will come, pack out the space. They stay till the very end. There was a standing ovation. Everybody stayed for, stayed for the discussion. And the purpose of the entire gathering was to say to the audience, we have dehumanized young women who are survivors of sexual violence to the degree that we don't see their humanity. So we don't even imagine how they might recover. But we have to because one, we have to deal with the consequence of there being such a prevalence of sexual violence, even as we tackle the reasons why that is. We have to do both and. And yeah. our work, though, is to put the tools in the hands of those who are the most vulnerable and privilege their experience so that they get that, some agency and some power back. I'm just so impressed with the, with the work. It's so awesome. I love oh, it. Good. And I wanted to ask you, because this seems like it's more of a, a Western-facing thing, but locally in Ghana... I think the play was a, was a wonderful piece about the emotional justice and, and dealing with what we're dealing with. But I've been listening a lot about trauma, ancestral trauma, and the things that we still hold, particularly here in Africa, dealing with the colonization and the different kind of different role that white people play. Absolutely. So what, are you, what have you been experiencing with implementing here in Ghana and on the continent in the same context? Yeah. So we have EJ, we have EJ Africa, EJ USA, and EJ UK. Specifically yeah. for the reason that you just said, 
is that one mm -hmm. of the things we want to honor is the way that colonization specifically shapes us here on the continent. So even though we have a flagship DEI training program, which we then adapt regionally according to mm -hmm. what is happening in whatever locale. So for example, we, you know, we use the word race and that language women, women in the West, but when we're in on the continent, we always say culture, we never say race. Mm -hmm. um, that's just a small example of recognizing the difference in how this actually works. A lot of our mm -hmm. work is around uh, gender healing and violence. Because I always yeah. say, you know, um, to, to be a girl and get from elementary school to through university and not get sexually harassed or raped is a miracle in this country. Mm -hmm. It is a miracle. Mm -hmm. And it's far too little. There's such a normalization of violence against girls that mm -hmm. there's just a way that we engage it. Even the play was about saying, even dealing with the agencies whose work this is, there's such a normalization. There's a normalization of violence, but there's also a failure to understand that you cannot possibly engage, do that kind of violence to a girl in a girl's body and not, then not be an aftermath. It's right. what we call the legacy of the untreated trauma. So here right. on the continent, very much around gender violence and healing specifically. And the mm -hmm. other part that's particular to Ghana is the, one of the pillars of the Beyond the Return platform, mm -hmm. which is creating pathways to the diaspora. We do something every Friday called Emotional Justice Fine Print Friday, and it is connecting global black people to African prints through stories. And it's a... Oh, yeah, it's a digital visual conversation. So today, for example, we did the shuka. The shuka is the known as the African blanket of the Maasai. Um, and when I went to Kenya, they said they kept saying to me, "Oh, you're Maasai, you're Maasai," because I'm so yeah, you're Maasai. I always get this yeah. when I go to Kenya that you're Kenyan. And I went out to the Maasai Mara and danced with the Maasai, and they gave me my blanket, and I rocked my blanket. And we were doing this. My team does the research on the history of the traditional shuka and then the ways that it's being contemporarily worn by a whole yeah. new generation. And we talk about the evolution of traditions that recognizes the way blacknesses have evolved. And so um, that's a specific part of EJ Africa that's unique to here. Um, yeah. And that's something we do every Friday. So there is regionality and specificity with emotional justice. Mm -hmm. And that's really mm -hmm. important to us because I don't like the collapsing of blackness as one monolithic thing. For example, right now, we're, we're just about to start work in South Africa. We're going through a whole set of training. And we know that definitely, of course, apartheid, black and white is a particular thing, but we also know there's a particular thing around xenophobia and tribe between the Ngoza and the Zulu and the Nigerians. That's a particular trauma that is a reflection in some ways of the trauma between global black people, Africans on the continent and, and black people in the diaspora. These wounds of white supremacy that have not been healed and then they manifest in how we deal with each other. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. And so, exactly. exactly. So, yeah, so we really, we're really, we're really careful and thoughtful before we go into spaces. You know, we're now doing some work. I can't name the company yet because we, we We've yet to, we're just finishing the deal before we announce it, but with a major entertainment company, we're going to be doing some work here on the continent. And one of the things we're, so, we're saying to them is you still want to collapse blackness as this mm. one thing. And they kept running into trouble in Africa. And I said, first of all, you really just need to stop calling it Africa. Like when you're in the 54 countries, you just have to be more specific. We're going to be doing some work there as well. So we're very clear and specific about the work in the UK is different than the work in the US. You know, there's a regionality of blackness and we're very specific about that, very intentional mm -hmm. about that. Like here in Ghana, we, we, look, we look specifically at gender and um, violence around girls and education specifically. Like it's a very specific area based on all the work and the research that I've been doing here. In mm -hmm. South Africa, we're, we're about to go in and do work around DEI. And DEI, you have a, this whole group of these very kind of liberal white South Africans who, you know, want to be woke on the, yeah. on, to their hundredth degree, but, you know, the DEI doesn't work. And so we've been brought in to look at what can we introduce. And so we have this training called Intimate Reckoning. And Intimate oh. Reckoning training is specifically for white women. It is specifically for white women. And it's specifically about intimate reckoning. It's about reckoning with how you use your power in your body as a white woman, woman when it comes to white men and against black people. 
because so much of the leadership comes from them. Do you know what I mean? So that's what we mean by we're really specific about how we engage the demography of emotions and the framework requires us, when we say in the context of race, gender and culture, that's what we mean. You have to get that specific. Otherwise mm -hmm. it's just not gonna work. And that's why things don't work because things are collapsed and they're very generic. And people are like, okay, that, that, that doesn't even apply to us. That's not even real for us. It's not true for us. Right. So right. Um, we do all that addition. And for me, because I've lived and worked and been a journalist in all these spaces, I've had the experience of the culture on the ground in a particular way. So I already know I'll say, okay, this, is, this doesn't work for whatever part this is, mm -hmm. or we allow for the kind of local engagement where, where they lead us and say, these are your fault lines. These are the areas you go or you don't go. This is where you, you can possibly make real, do you know what I mean? We do that local expertise and allow ourselves to be led. So um, mm -hmm. I'm really, really proud of the Institute. I'm so proud of the team, you know, that I'm building. I'm very proud of the fact that we're HQ'd on the continent here in Accra, mm -hmm. but we're formally registered in the US and the UK. And I always wanted a global organization whose HQ was Africa. And that right. as an African woman, I'm leading and developing resources that are used in other parts of the world. Because I always say, you know, this is a weird thing. When we say global, for some reason, nobody really seems to mean Africa. I mean, we know we mean Africa. But so yeah. often, I used to tease, I used to tease folks in the, when I lived in New York and say, uh, you know, when you say global, you mean the difference between New York and New Orleans. And I don't mean that, but, what, but you know what I mean? I'm just really being sarcastic. But it yeah. really was about the, the exclusion of the continent when it came to exploring the global. Yeah. And then treating yeah. it as this kind of stepchild, not to disrespect right. stepchildren, but treating it as this orphan that just doesn't yeah. have parents. Right. It's dangling out there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Requiring somebody to, you know, do something. So speaking of mindset, because that's a total mindset hack, exactly what you you've just described. So this is where I ask what your favorite or an innovative mindset hack is. So this is one that you actually know of or one that you can imagine. What a beautiful question. For me, it really starts with the willingness or the unwillingness to change my own mind based on the work that I'm doing. I think we, living here in Ghana, we, have a, we talk a lot about changing mindsets, but it's always an external reality. We always think somebody else needs to change their mindset, and if somebody else changes their mindset, then everything will be fine. And it doesn't necessarily start with a person talking about the mindset shift. And so for me... I'm always a student of anywhere I live. I've always been a student of wherever I live and I go in as a student. And so I go in open and expecting to be taught. I do not go in believing that I know, I go in expecting to be taught and to be taught, to be corrected, to be shown by whom, whomever is in my environment. That kind of spiritual and emotional openness for me is how I define mindset. Because what it allows me to do is recognize that there is a set of skills that may not work in this space, some new skills that I will have to develop that I didn't even imagine would be needed. And I think even more importantly, it allows me to recover from mistakes that might otherwise change my relationship with the place that I'm living and with the people that I'm working. That kind of recovery from inevitable mistakes, you can't safeguard yourself from everything, really serves how I want to grow in the work that I do and also how I lead and how I lead the team. And as somebody who's creative, occasionally, I don't call it creative block. I just think that it, because the tools we use are creative, they need replenishments. That's not just recovery, they need mm. replenishment. It's literally like, it's like an account. You take out all your money mm -hmm. and there's literally nothing left where you just can't keep taking, there's nothing else to take. Right. And so learning, learning what replenishment must look like for me personally, for us as a team, organizationally, and because of the relationship that I have to the city and to the country and that relationship that it has with me. So mm -hmm. creative replenishment takes place in multiple ways, but it has to take place. And it's both mm -hmm. small, it's small and it's big. So it, it's small in that I take these particular tea breaks. Anybody who knows me knows that I, the most 
colonized mm-hmm. part of me is the way that I do tea. I do tea the way the British do tea, like back in the 19th century. So I don't mean sure. make a cup of tea. I don't mean make a cup of tea. So like I have to go somewhere where they do tea in a beautiful teacup and a, and a glass. I'll get dressed, dressed up. I brought a pink lip today because why not? The sun's out. I'll put on one sure. of my night. I, I love a jumpsuit. <laughs> rock a jumpsuit. Put some nice earrings in. I'll put on some heels and it's me. And go yeah. somewhere where I can sit and have tea and just enjoy my tea. And for me, that is, that is replenishment. And I sit, I take a book, I switch off everything. There's no phones, there's no gadgets. And I sit, I usually, I usually take a book, sometimes, I, sometimes not even that, but it's not a book of prose. It would usually be poetry. And, and then I will just sit and read and people watch for two hours, three hours, four hours, do nothing. And that's a small replenishment that I have. That's something that I do regularly. With COVID, nice. I've had to recreate it in, in my house, but I still do it. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I have my whatever. Yeah, we've all, we've all lived in jogging pants, what my dear friend Charlotte calls COVID couture. We've all lived in that. Right. Time. So I literally, like now, today, I said, I'm going to put on my jumpsuit. I've, it's been a, a big week. I need some replenishment. Yeah. I put on one of my favorite jumpsuits, put on a bold lip. I'm going to have some lemongrass tea. We grow lemongrass in the garden, have some Ghanaian honey, nice. sit in my lazy nice. boy chair, take out a, a poem. I'm going to switch off the computer, switch off the phones. And because the day is crazy, I can probably do about 30, 40 minutes, but I'll still do it. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Okay. The bigger one, yeah. the bigger ones is travel. And so I claim three cities as home. So I'll make a decision to go and see friends. You know what I mean? But I have dear, dear friends who are family in London. I have dear, dear friends who are family and community in New York. And I'll, I'll make a trip that I've, I'm learning, to, that I've learned to not make anything about work, to just go see friends. I love art, museums, theater, and I'll make that trip. But that's a big replenishment. But you know what I mean? You need small yeah. and big ones so that you can consistently yeah. fill your creative tank up on a regular basis. So that's for me. And and then I love to dance, so I do Zumba. Zumba is my other replenishment. Okay. And in okay. my other life, I was a Broadway dancer and a lead choreographer. <laughs> and I'm sticking to that. So when I when I lived in when I lived in London and I was a, a journalist uh, with with the BBC, when I was leaving one of the jobs that I was doing, the um, the host got me this fantastic gift, which was a year's a year long membership to Dance Works, which is an amazing studio in central London, just near Selfridges. And yeah. I was like, I'm gonna join the circus. I'm going to be a performer. <laughs> and so I, I, I went in like it's me. So I got a whole wardrobe, I got all the outfits, I got all my leotards, uh-huh. the whole thing. And I did everything. I did, be- I did beginner's ballet, beginner's hip hop, beginner's Broadway. I did everything and I, and I got really good actually, I was shocked. But I had so much fun. And, and so here in Ghana, there's an amazing uh, class led by a wonderful woman called Chen who does Zumba. So I go do Zumba okay. and I take myself back. It's the same thing. Being creative mm-hmm. and working with a framework is a lot of intellectual work. So mm-hmm. uh, Zumba, the same way as tea, it takes me all out of my head and puts me in mm-hmm. my body. And I want to mm-hmm. just sweat and laugh and feel and be free and not, not be in my head at all. And so those things are really important for me for maintaining, you know, replenishment. And this year, I've said it for years, but this year it's finally going to happen. I'm going to take up yoga, which to be okay. honest, let me be yeah. honest, I've never liked it. I've tried it multiple times and I have just never got into it. But I recognize how good it will be for my body. Being, I'm long and, yeah. and, and lean and I want to maintain that limberness. And yes. I think we just need peace. This time is so crazy. We need peace. Yeah. Actually, there's an amazing sister here, Nana and Wako and Nen. I call her Nana Bliss because she runs Bliss yeah. Yoga. Yeah. Love that sister. Love Nana and Wako. She's a total visionary. And so mm-hmm. hers are the classes that I'm going to join. And that's going to be my additional regular replenishment. So small replenishments regularly and then big ones whenever at some point we can travel again. Nice, 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 nice. That's good. I, I really, I enjoy that story because that, that tells us so much about you, which mm. I always like to talk mm. about the work, but it's nice to also know about, about you. Mm. So 
Esther, we're getting to the end of our conversation. Oh, this is um, so fun. I know, I know. But before I let you go, I want to know a little, we want to know, because your mind is so brilliant, what kind of thing, so I believe you're probably all of these things, but what would you say you're more of, a listener, a watcher, or a reader? Listener. Okay, so what are you listening to these days? So I want to qualify that, because, you know, okay. I'm weird like that. So I'm... I'm a person who listens, but I listen with my ears and my eyes. Mm, I, I can relate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I say that because there are things that you see, but you don't see in a traditional sense. It's almost as if you're listening, but you're listening with your eyes. There's a way that mm-hmm. information goes in. So I'm definitely a, I'm a listener, you know, 100%. Mm-hmm. And when I say I'm a listener, I listen as much to the silence as I do to the language because I think the silence is usually more revealing and it guides you about not just where to go but where not to go where people's pain is versus where the power may lie so I think Mm -hmm. to learn to listen to the silence in between sentences the the pause between question and answer is really for me really important so I'm definitely a listener okay so I want to say that that is, I think, as you take on yoga, that that is going to be something that is a recurring theme because it's the space between the asanas and it's the space between the ohms that is the that your your attention is called to. So that you said that, like, listen to what it is and what what is not, is is part of the transformational piece of being in that practice. Um, Mm, So so, interesting. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. You know what's interesting that you say that? So it doesn't make sense to me that I have such a weird aversion to yoga when what you're saying makes so much sense to me. Yeah, you just need and I think practicing at Bliss is a prop as a wonderful start. I I went to India with with Lana. So she organized a whole retreat. I went we are, we're all together, so I definitely stamp of approval, definitely a good place to go and identify this new self. Yeah. As, a, as a yogi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think that's a great place to put a pin in our conversation for now. Mm-hmm. Um, before we go, do you have any last words for our listeners? I really want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, the, um, for the vision and for doing the work that nobody sees in order for all of us to benefit from the work that we get to hear. I know that that journey is never easy and, you know, people pay so much attention to the results. They don't know the amount of work that goes in before there ever is a result. So I think local citizens, I love that combination of globality and locality. I think that's beautiful language. So I just want to say thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your work. Because you reached out and asked me about this, it led me to the others that you've had. So one of my new rituals is on a, usually on a Friday, I go into the Global Citizen Archive and I listen to one of the oh. stories. And um, it's, a, it's a beautiful, and I, like, I love to listen. I, and I think, I think voice and sound is music. Um, yes. Yeah. Just the spoken voice is music. I also think it's ancestral. It takes me home in particular mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. So my last two words are thank you. And thank you, too. Thank you. I very much appreciate those words. Those are wonderful words. Thank you, Esther. My pleasure. Yes. Okay, Global Citizens, this has been another episode of the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around doing something in the world. You can find out more about Esther, more about everything she's doing in our show notes and always at www.localcitizenspod.com. We will have links to all of Esther's um, socials and her website, and you should definitely check it out because her website is awesome. And as always, please share, comment, reach out. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, bye for now.